was born with a purpose. A purpose that would change everything. He would prepare the way of the Lord. Again I say to you, the message, repent to Israel, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The baptisms, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. I baptize you with water, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I. The imprisonment, his death. I must decrease so that he may increase. They called him John the Baptist. Join the Reverend Dr. Dylan to song this and every Wednesday night at 7.30 for the Bible study series entitled They Called Him John the Baptist on our YouTube page at Edgewater Baptist Church. Welcome to the online Bible study series of the Edgewater Waterford Circuit of Baptist Churches in St. Catherine, Jamaica. And as usual, a special welcome to those of you viewing from overseas. May our time be meaningfully spent. But before we go any further, let us pray. And so now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The last time we met in this capacity, we began a brand new series entitled, They Called Him John the Baptist. And in so doing, the last time, we sought to introduce ourselves, as it were, to this new series. And in so doing, we began with an overview. An overview which stated that the series constitutes a biographical study of one of the most complex and controversial figures, individuals, really, in the Bible. And in fact, there are those, we said, who regard John the Baptist as both a mystique and a marvel. And then we looked on some objectives because we noted that at the end of this study, Faithful participants will, first of all, have a greater knowledge and understanding of who John the Baptist was. Also, they'll have a deeper appreciation for his mission and his ministry. They'll also have a clearer sense of his role and responsibility as a servant of God. And then they'll have a stronger determination to do the work of the Lord, regardless of how challenging and endangering it may be. And then we made some observations last time. Observations like the fact that the phrase John the Baptist is mentioned at least 13 times in the New Testament. We also noted that some versions actually state John the Baptizer instead of John the Baptist. And indeed, sometimes he's simply referred to as John. For example, Matthew 11, verse 2. We also observed last week that although it is not articulated in the Bible, quite likely, John the Baptist was called John the Baptist for two main reasons. First of all, because of the 
nature of his baptisms. We're going to see that his baptisms were a bit different than the others. And also because of the number of his baptisms, perhaps. It seems as if he was having a number of baptisms in the ministry that God has in, had entrusted to him. And maybe that is why he was given the moniker John the Baptist. And then last week we noted an outline. An outline of sorts in terms of how the study over the coming weeks and months will be guided. And we said that the study will be guided by the following subheadings. For example, prophecy. Next, we'll be looking on the background of John the Baptist, his birth, his lifestyle, the message that he proclaimed. We're going to be looking at the baptisms themselves, his imprisonment, his death, and of course the legacy that he left for countless generations to follow. And then we closed last week by noting some outstanding phrases, some outstanding phrases which we made mention of. First of all, Matthew 3 verse 2 which states, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Also, Matthew 3 verse 7, which says, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Matthew 3 verse 8, where he says, bring forth therefore fruits as proof of repentance. Matthew 3 verse 10, John the Baptist stated, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. And Matthew 3 verse 11, where John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Then finally we noted Matthew 11 verse 3, where he said, are you he that should come or should we look for another? And so we closed it. We closed our introduction last week on that note as we sought to prepare the ground, as it were, for this interesting and intriguing study. And so... Tonight, whatever time you are viewing this broadcast, really, we are now about to segue into part one of our series. They called him John the Baptist. And in so doing, I'd like for us to bear a couple of things in mind as we focus tonight on the prophecies, yes, the prophecies about John the Baptist. The prophecies about John the Baptist. Now let us get this clear. What really is prophecy? What really is prophecy? Well, prophecy may be defined as the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed, divinely inspired truth. I repeat, prophecy may be defined as the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed, divinely inspired truth. Now, throughout the Bible, Prophecy includes both of the following. Firstly, foretelling. And secondly, forthtelling. Now, foretelling is, as we know, being able to actually state what is believed to be a future event or series of events. 
foretelling is speaking what is to come. But forth telling is actually speaking and referring and addressing what is happening in the now. What is happening in the society? What is happening in the region? What is happening in the world? What is happening all around us? It is God's word having to bear on the present circumstance. That is what we call forth telling. And foretelling is about the future and not so much about the present. Now what we are saying here is that throughout the Bible, prophecy includes both. And so we have books of the Bible. We have prophetic books, for example, in the Old Testament. That in more ways than one spoke about future events, coming events. But we also have some books of the Old Testament, prophetic books that spoke in regards to foretelling. For example, the book of Amos. Amos is not about what is to come or what is to happen in the future. It was about what was happening then in Amos' time, addressing the ills of the society and affirming the positives within the society. Books like Jeremiah, Daniel, Isaiah, having both elements, foretelling and foretelling, were dealing with both elements of prophecy. So again, throughout the Bible, we must bear in mind that prophecy includes both foretelling and foretelling. Now, according to 1 John 4, verse 1, we should believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That's the word of God. Saying that we should, in essence, test, try every single spirit because there are false prophets who are in the world. It's against that backdrop that I'd like to state that there are two main litmus tests which are laid out in the book of Deuteronomy. So in terms of testing or trying the spirits, the Bible actually gives us two litmus tests and interestingly, they are found in the book of Deuteronomy. First of all, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 17 to 22. And it states, And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Well, when a prophet speaks the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. You shall not be afraid of him. Why? He has prophesied, quote unquote, presumptuously because that which has been, has been spoken by him did not happen, did not come to pass. So in essence, the first litmus test is a litmus test of accuracy. 100% accuracy, total accuracy 
it must come to pass. If not, that prophet has spoken presumptuously. The next litmus test comes from Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 to 5, which reads, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him. And keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dream of dreams shall be put to death. Because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And redeemed you from the house of bondage. To entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So. You shall put away the evil from your midst. And of course, what we are seeing here is that scriptural consistency is the next litmus test. The first one was total accuracy and now scriptural consistency. In other words, if a prophecy is given and it actually happens the way the prophet so-called had prophesied it, don't be quick to get carried away with that because if that individual is leading you on a path that is not according to the will, plan, and purpose of God and God's word, then he's saying here, do not follow that, pro that prophet. Don't follow that person because that person is seeking to lead you astray. You see, you can predict things and they actually happen. It doesn't mean that it came from God. And so that is why 1 John 4 verse 1 says we need to test, test, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And what are the two tests? Total accuracy, 100%. And scriptural consistency. It must be consistent with the word of God. So okay. Happy that I could get that sort of out of the way. As we now focus on the prophecies concerning John the Baptist. And so as we examine those prophecies about John the Baptist. Which we are about to do. Please note the following. One, their pronouncement. Their pronouncement. We're going to be, therefore, looking at the scriptures, Old Testament, really, where they are indicated, they are pronounced clearly by the prophets of God. And we begin with Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 3 to 5 states, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord or prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So that's Isaiah 40. Another pronouncement is made in Malachi 3 verse 1. The first of two found in Malachi. And in Malachi 3 verse 1 it states, Behold, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom he seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, 
says the Lord of hosts. That's Malachi 3 verse 1. And then we have also Malachi 4 verse 5. And Malachi 4 verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. So that's Malachi 4 verse 5, Malachi 3 verse 1. And then we first looked at Isaiah 40 verse 3 to verse 5. All of these three passages give clear pronouncements in regards to John the Baptist. At least that's the belief. And so we move from the pronouncements of these prophecies about John the Baptist to their assessment. That's the second point tonight, their assessment. Let's see if we can assess these prophecies and look at them carefully and make some determinations, revelations, observations coming out of our assessment of these pronouncements. First of all, the dates. Now, a cursory glance at these verses that were just read. We wouldn't find the dates listed. But Bible scholars and theologians have pretty much agreed, in essence, that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, was written approximately in 700 BC. That's before Christ. 700 years before the coming of Christ. And Malachi, the book of Malachi, was written approximately 430 BC. 430. So when you look at it, between 430 to 700 years before Christ came on the scene, these prophecies were on hand. That's a long time, beloved. That's a long time for prophecies to be given and persons who have come and died and gone and new generations have come and passed without the prophecies actually coming to pass. And what this shows, beloved, is that when prophecies are made, if they are not time-specific, let's be careful how quick we are to write them off. Because it was at least 700 years before the prophecies in regards to John the Baptist were actually at a point of coming to pass, becoming realities. Isaiah, 700 years before. Malachi, 430 years. Also, in our assessments, we not only look at the dates, but also the descriptions. Because there are three distinct descriptions given about the individual who is focused on in each of the passages that I shared earlier from Isaiah 40, Malachi 3, and Malachi chapter 4. Let's begin with Isaiah 40 verse 3. The individual described in Isaiah 40 verse 3 may be regarded and described as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So whomever this individual would be 700 years after would be like a voice, not an echo, but a voice crying out in the wilderness, whichever wilderness that would be. That's interesting to note that if you're looking for the individual, if you're seeking the signs, if you're seeking the, the, the indications and indicators of who Isaiah was referring to, you're looking at a voice, listening out for a voice that will be crying in the wilderness. And then in Malachi 3 verse 1, the individual described is 
called the messenger of the Lord. Come on, M. Because in the rest of that verse, there is also another uh, mention of messenger, and it is believed that that's referring to Jesus Christ, capital M. But now, the messenger of the Lord. So whomever it would be, which whomever the prophet Malachi is referring to, would also be a messenger with a message in regards to the Lord, the Messiah. And then last, but by no means least, as we continue to make our assessment of these prophecies about John the Baptist, Malachi 4 verse 5, the individual is described as Elijah, the prophet of the Lord. Now, please remember, Elijah had died donkey years before Malachi was written, the prophet Elijah. So, it's not referring to Elijah that we find in the books of Kings and all of that. No, this is referring to someone that is called Elijah. This person perhaps had a ministry or would have a ministry that in many ways patterned the ministry of Elijah when he was on earth. And so Elijah the prophet, perhaps as a metaphor, as an example, is used to describe the individual that Malachi 4 verse 5 is referring to. Now isn't that interesting? So we have these three uh, descriptions and descriptors. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, the messenger of the Lord, and Elijah the prophet of the Lord. Remember now, over the space of 700 430 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. Many people were wondering, no doubt, who were these prophets referring to? Not seeing, not knowing, not being able to identify until Jesus came. Until the time of the Lord. And so now we go as our third Major point tonight, their fulfillment. Not only the pronouncement, not only the, our assessment, but now the fulfillment. In what ways do we see that these prophecies were fulfilled and pointing to one particular person known as John the Baptist? Well, let me refresh your memory. Isaiah 40 verse 3 the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Well, in Matthew 3, verse 1 and verse 3, it reads, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching where? In the wilderness. In the wilderness of Judea. Verse 3, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Can't get it clearer than that. That's, that's pretty direct. That's pretty clear, is it not? That the reference is to John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and he's the voice. Crying in that wilderness, saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And also, Malachi 3 verse 1, if you remember, states, Behold, I will send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. I send my messenger. In Matthew, Matthew 11, 7 and 10. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, that's John the Baptist, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? And Jesus is still speaking, for this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before 
your face who will prepare your way before you. Another clearly distinct reference to John the Baptist by Jesus himself saying that this is the person to whom the reference was made in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. And then Malachi 4 verse 5. Again it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In Matthew 11, verse 13 to 14, it states, For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. That's Jesus speaking, by the way. Distinctly saying, all of those prophets... Prophecies point unto John. And John is the Elijah who was prophesied to come. And in Luke 1, verse 11 to 13 and verse 17, it reads, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. That's John the Baptist. And verse 17, He will also go. The angel is still speaking. Now he's almost prophesying and confirming at the same time. He also will go before him in the spirit and power of, of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Remember that he also will go before him, Jesus, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Same thing in essence that Malachi 4 verse 5 had prophesied 430 years before. Isn't that awesome? And so without a doubt, everybody, these prophecies, these three prophecies in Isaiah and Malachi all point to one person, John the Baptist. And regardless of how long beforehand they were prophesied, they were fulfilled in one person. We should never take prophecies lightly. In fact, in, in the New Testament it says we should not despise prophecy, but we should despise false prophecy. And prophecies are, when they are from God, say a lot and mean a lot. As we wrap up our study tonight, I leave with you some questions to consider. Number one, what are your main concerns in regards to prophets and prophecies in the world today? What are your main concerns in regards to prophets and prophecies in the world today? If you have any, what are they? And number two, why is there seemingly so much emphasis on foretelling rather than forth? telling in the world today. Do you have any answers for that? Why is there seemingly so much emphasis on foretelling rather than forth telling in the world today? I'm inviting you. If you have your answers, questions, or concerns, if you have need for counseling and prayer, our Prayer and counseling hotline numbers are 876-220-6474 and 876-332-7956. Believe you me, there is someone on the other end of that line or those lines ready, waiting to pray and counsel with and for you. And speaking about prayer, would you join me 
in prayer. And so, Lord, we honor your word. We honor your words of prophecy over the years and months, over the decades, over the centuries. We thank you that your word is sure. And what you say you mean and what you mean you say. We thank you that we have the assurance that when you speak, whether through foretelling or forthtelling, that we can take heed and should take heed, knowing that you have a word for every season of our lives. And so, Lord, we avail ourselves to you in the to be used by you. And so, Lord, we open our lives to receive more of what you have to say to us and through us, whether by foretelling or foretelling. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this evening. Grant us patience to allow your word to be fulfilled in our lives. For we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you desire prayer and counseling, please call our prayer and counseling hotline at 876-220-6474 or send a WhatsApp message to 876-332-7956. Remember to share, like, and subscribe to our YouTube page. Continue to pray for each other. Have a blessed week in the Lord.